Lord forgive me for this trap shit Sergeant Smack make it backflip Telly Hank it with the action With the vital speaking Spanish Frank Matthews how I vanish Poof Came back like I'm King Tut Go BBS is on a beamer When Fat Cat was tearing queens up Fall off the profit not the re-up Fly like Puerto Rican Jesus Uptown like I'm Baby Main Just caught a touchdown In March of 1999, possibly following the entrepreneurial spirits of their boss, a set of 21-year-old twins will publish a book titled Eyes of a Killer Slash Behind Enemy Lines. Published by St. Martin's Press, the book no longer available for print, but according to Google Books, the excerpt on the back will read, the story was based on true events saying eyes of a killer is a riveting story of a teenager from a new york ghetto who moves to new orleans to start over only to find himself chewed up and spit out by the crescent city powerful drug infested underworld information from their indictment just two months later that may gave a slight glimpse of where they just might have got the idea from people don't realize this I still remember the day when No Limits started going down. No Limits started going down when Keenan Abel went to jail. And nobody was getting him out of jail. Because everybody around the office going, well, wow, they're still in jail, you know? And uh, they, they received no help from him, you know? You know, I remember going to KLC's house. The wall was like five, six, seven times longer than this wall. They had plaques. As far as you can see, the whole wall was filled with plaques. Mm -hmm. Them boys did more in a year than most record companies do in their whole tenure. The year is 1998, and the independent Southern powerhouse is about to take over the game. After signing the West Coast's biggest rap star, the label would have an unprecedented year. Oh, so when you want to get a grown up to even do something, you fire on fire. We push it. That's my language. See, now we talking at my house. I got the four court. I've been cutting the imitation. I just cut the imitation all in y'all pocket. What I got to do, man? Goddamn, I got to tie you up and throw you out there? We gonna come. Out of the 23 projects they put out in 98, 18 of them would go either gold or platinum, with some of them going four times over. Say Andrew, what was happening? What do we got? I'm trying to look. Holding up. What's happening, man? <laughs> you can find him across your camera. Yeah, check this out, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know that bitch expensive. It's like, you, it's like you can get it for like 1900 at the Sony store. So how'd the video go? Uh, we still shoot, motherfucker. For how many days? Four days. Right. Get him, Duff. Okay, let me try. What do you got? That's your crew now? Where's that? The Mac? You got the R? What's up, Hey. Look at my son. What's the name of. Kelly Jameson now. Sean told me Kelly, then the CC mail CC me wants CC mail went out McKell McKelly or McKay or whatever and then Sean's looking for smooth right now to fucking ask him. I'm like It's not Kelly. I that's what Sean told me this morning. And then Sean told me So what is it guys? It's McKelly and they're you point these nuts. Yeah, I'm down low. Silk, silk the shocker right there. 
But looking back at it now, they also could be easily nominated as the most gangster rap label. With artists that had beaten murder charges, been convicted of murder, and even wrongly accused of murder. But two of the biggest gangsters on the label would be a set of twins from New York City. Video go go. We got Kane and Abel in the house. AJ What's in the up, house. Man? What's up? What's happening? Kane and Abel represent No Limit Records, baby. Tank. Family cookout. You know, somebody else's family, a uh, family reunion, whatever. They always happen when the twins come. You know, the twins always because they're the twins. And, and this family is no exception. No Limit family has twins also. Kane and Abel. Seven, 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 seven. What's the spice that Cain and Abel bring to the whole pot of gumbo? Our music is like, basically, you know what I'm saying? If you know our story, you know what I'm saying? We, we grew up, we basically raised ourselves, you know, our parents died when we were little. So our music just brings that reality of, of everything we write, everything we say, we've been through, you know what I'm saying? It's like we got spirituality and our stuff is reality, but at the same time, you know, all praise to the most high, we bring that other that other side of it. We ain't just talking about like running around, just killing people, you know what I'm saying? We talking about the reasons why death happens and the reasons why people die and, and just, you know what I'm saying, just God looking over us, you know what I'm saying, and things like that. Is that why y'all chose? Name, Kane Abel. Basically, yeah, you know, brothers, it's just like Cain Abel for first murder, you know what I'm saying? And jealousy, you know, it's over jealousy. That's what's happening out here on the street. Brothers killing each other over this jealousy, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, that's just the name that fit, because we just trying to bring that message, man, you know what I'm saying? This is exactly what's happening. That's why this reality music is, is can't be stopped, because it's so real, you know what I'm saying? The name of the album is The Seven Sins. You have, uh, you, you also you have a spirituality about yourselves, and you also um, have the names Cain and Abel. You know what I'm saying? What is, how's the seven sins tying to all of this? You see, basically, you know, Cain and Abel is just like we just we meant. You know what I'm saying? It's, the album is hard. You know what I'm saying? But men have two sides. They got the hard side, and yet they got, you know what I'm saying, the side of them that's, you know what I'm saying? Seal. Seal, you know what I'm saying? And maybe you might not see it till we go to a funeral and, and see one of our brothers go on the ground. That's when you see that side, you know what I'm saying? Right. And the seven sins, you know, brothers committing these sins every day. That's just the reason why, you know, it's heaven or hell, you know what I'm saying? The sins that we commit, you know what I'm saying? It ain't just like sloth, greed. It's, 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 the sins that we commit, you know what I'm saying? Jealousy, murder, you know what I'm saying? Drugs. We try to go to the like, root of everything, you know? Cain and Abel, just like the name, go to the root of the first murder. Seven sins go to the root of every murder and every crime, you know? So that's basically we are. We're trying to go to the beginning, the root, you know what I'm saying? Money, the root of all evil. That's what this whole music industry revolves around. So, murder up and tell After losing their parents early, the twins will have a rough life growing up in the Bronx eventually moving to New Orleans. They would attend Xavier University, majoring in mass communications. And in 1995, they would form the group Double Vision and sign to an independent label where they would release their debut album, Keep Your Eyes Open. That project would find the ears of the mama of No Limit, Mia X, leading her to bring the set of brothers to Master P and No Limit, who would immediately sign them. They would go from Double Vision to Cain and Abel, and in 96, they would release the album Seven Sins under No Limit Records. The album would chart at number 29 on Billboard's top hip-hop rap albums, but that would only be the beginning of the twins' success, because in 1999, during the reign of No Limit, the two brothers would release the album I Am My Brother's Keeper, which would become their most successful project with the lead single Time After Time featuring Master P. The album would sell 250,000 copies in the first week. It would eventually reach number one on the Billboard charts, beating out albums like Nori's debut album, Nori, and Cameron's debut album, Confessions of Fire. However, after the release of that album, family ties, as well as them being tied to 30 kilos, would make the relationship between the twins and Master P and No Limit complicated. Was it really 
really like a mutual agreement between you and P, or was it kind of like with all the uh, lawsuits and you know you guys going to jail, and was it just P didn't want all that trouble around his label, or what was the real deal? No, it was a mutual agreement to be the businessman, we're a businessman, you know what I'm saying? And uh, we saw that the opportunity to go and move on and do all things, and also he saw that the opportunity to kind of keep himself from all the bad publicity so it was a win-win situation for both of us it's I got asked a question the other day and I'm going to tell you what the question was and I was asked who do I think was the most dangerous people you know at No Limit and people don't know the whole story about Cain and Abel and who their uncle was um, their mother's brother was named Pena and he was one of the biggest drug dealers in the United States from New York to Miami. He ran with a very dangerous Puerto Rican, you know, Puerto Rican crew. And a lot of people don't know that Cain and Abel are Puerto Ricans. They're from New York. And uh, man, his Cain and Abel family was very, very dangerous, you know. His uncle, was, his uncle was the type of person that you hear on Monday and you go on on Wednesday. That's how dangerous it was. Man told me in the letter, he said, when I made 30 million in a game, I supposed to retire. This man said he found five million in a van. This is the same man. Go back and check the documentary of what Master P did when he talked about the Spanish boy who offered him a million dollars and all this and this. This is the same man I'm talking about, Rich Opinion. He's in a fed right now, him and his family. He got a life sentence. He wrote me a letter, he pled guilty to eight murders. And he told me that if the feds ever let him out, I mean, if he beat them eight murders, he had, they had 23 more waiting on him. The twins would be indicted on March 25th of 1999 after they would be linked to a 30 kilogram shipment from Richard Pena, their alleged uncle and their mother's brother, who already at that time had a long history of criminal activities said to be born in the Dominican Republic. He would move to the United States from Puerto Rico and end up settling in the New Orleans neighborhoods of Avondale and West Wego. And his indictment would state that his influence in the streets would begin as early as the early 90s, when in February of 1990, in the efforts to legalize some of his drug profits, he would open up a body shop called Gator Collision Center in a town called Marrero. He would be arrested the very next year in late September of 1991, allegedly carrying over $25,000 in a bag. After police would respond to a 911 call for gunfire and observe him driving recklessly, his indictment would state that by 1992, he would purchase a 25-foot boat called the Sea Ray Sundancer, and he would begin to look into some of his many ventures into expanding into the music industry. By June of 1993, him and several other guys, Roderick Smith, Brian Lott, and Mitch Harden, would establish All Together Entertainment to promote concerts and rap artists in the area. And it would also be that year where authorities would get a little glimpse of actually how big he was when in July of 93, he would rent a motel room in the city of Kenner, allegedly to collect money for a cocaine deal that was said to go down in Houston. But the thing about that particular deal is it was part of a federal drugs thing. And days later, on July 25th, 1993, several of his associates, including one of his family members, Johnny Pena, would be arrested in Houston, where authorities would seize a little over $207,000. He would continue to dabble into the entertainment industry, where he would found Crystal Incorporated, opening several Latin nightclubs, Barocco 2000 and SEMA. He even would allegedly be the main backing behind a 1996 Tupac concert at the Superdome. But in all the efforts to clean up his money, the authorities were still on his trail. In May of 1995, one of his alleged carriers, a female by the name of Beverly Ann Harrison, would be stopped on I-10 near Gulfport, Mississippi, and after searching the vehicle she had been riding in, authorities would locate and seize $601,394.
And by the summer of 1995, you will begin to see more writing on the wall. The one that would kind of sort of put the nail in the coffin would occur on August 26, 1995, when a guy by the name of Richard Curtis would disappear. After being arrested, Richard Curtis would be placed under arrest by a New Orleans police officer by the name of David Singleton, who would be arrested and eventually cooperate with the government, testifying that he had handed over Richard Curtis to Richard Pena and his associates. Richard Curtis's remains would be found later that year on October 29, 1995, in a wooded area near Purlington, Mississippi. And by 1997, the organization would come crumbling down when several of his associates, one being one of his co-defendants, Jeanette Maradiago, would be arrested in the Bronx, and Pablo Patriana, who was arrested and found with 80000 on his person. An indictment and arrest warrant would be handed down for Richard Pena on April 1st, 1997, and he would be arrested later that month along with several of his family members at the Diamond Head Resort in Mississippi. The U.S. Marshals would seize 440000 from a Holiday Inn in Waveland, Mississippi, along with $25,913 from a car that the group was said to be using. Two months later, in June of 1997, Richard Pena's alleged top hitman and masterpiece cousin, Randall Callio Watts, would be shot and killed in the B.W. Cooper housing projects. His brother Troy would be arrested the very next month by the NOPD and FBI on July 4th, 1997, in connection to small kilogram shipments he allegedly received from Richard Pena. After being indicted and parting ways with No Limit Records, the success would still continue for Master P and the group, starting off 1999 with the release of Silk the Shocker's album, Made Men, which would peak at number one on the U.S. Billboard charts. Continuing to the very next year of 2000, when the 504 Boys would release the album, Goodfellas, that would peak at number two on the Billboard charts. But just three years later, and not even five years from Cain and Abel's indictment and their unprecedented success, Master P and No Limit were filed for bankruptcy on December 17, 2003, citing various lawsuits, eventually forcing Master P to sell off the legendary No Limit catalog that he helped build. Now, it's hard to point at one specific time when we're talking about the fall of a hip hop empire. I'm not going to go as far as say that Cain and Abel's indictment brought the label down, but it definitely seemed like the beginning of the end. Some people would probably talk about the artists on the label that time or even them oversaturating the market by putting out too many projects. But really, what do y'all think caused the fall of No Limit? I mean, them niggas put out 23 projects and almost 80% of them. 18 of them went either gold or platinum and something I definitely don't think that'll ever be seen again. And just doing this episode alone made me question where No Limit ranks as far as these legendary rap labels that we have seen. And y'all definitely let me know where y'all think they rank as far as with the Death Rose and the Rockefellers and the Murder Inks and the Rough Riders. And you definitely can't forget cash money. Y'all also make sure y'all hit the red bell and subscribe button right under this video. So y'all know when this real trail spill shit is dropping. Y'all get in the comment box below. Y'all let me know what cities we need to go to. What stories we need to tell. What we missed. What we got wrong. All of that. Y'all tapping with me directly on Instagram. Twitter. P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. And until the next play. Y'all know how we rocking. It's Shay's Pop-A-Lot. Salute the almighty mob.